Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who bought us back from sin, death, and the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death, that I should be his own. Once again, dear friends, as our Passion history has become, been coming from Mark chapter 14. Once again, our sermon text comes from John from chapter 18. Simon Peter and another disciple kept following Jesus. That disciple was known to the high priest. So he went into the high priest's courtyard with Jesus. But Peter stood outside by the door. So the other disciple, the one known to the high priest, went out and talked to the girl watching the door and brought Peter in. You are not one of this man's disciples too, are you? The girl at the door asked Peter. I am not, he said. Dear fellow pilgrims on the road up to Jerusalem, when you were born... You received the last name of your father. And that name stands for things. It stands for the reputation that your father earned and, and his siblings and parents. It stands for certain family characteristics and traits. In your life, then, you either bring credit to that name or shame. As a Christian, you were also given another name, the name of your father. In holy baptism, you were called a child of God. We heard just a couple of days ago in our epistle lesson, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Indeed, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. God has put his name on you. He's made you a member of his family. And now you either bring honor to that name or disgrace it. You bring honor or shame to that name by the way you answer or fail to answer the question which the servant girl put to Peter. It's the question of loyalty. You are not one of this man's disciples too, are you? One of this man's disciples. So who is this man. As far as that servant girl was concerned, this man was just another one of the religious zealots in ancient Israel who had stepped on the toes of the authorities and had to somehow be dealt with. This man meant nothing in particular to that servant girl, at that point in time at least, Later that night, this man would say under oath, as we heard, Yes, you are right, I am the Christ, the Son of the Highest, a King, and you will see me, the Son of Man, coming on the clouds of heaven to judge with all the angels and with the power and authority of God. And then on the next day, this man would say, It is finished. All the prophecies of the Old Testament are now fulfilled from Moses all the way to Malachi. The sufferings are now over. The cup of wrath that I prayed the Father to take away, but only if it was his will, has now been drunk to its bitter last dregs. The work of mankind's redemption is completed. This man would then say, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, and then he would die. And then just two days later, three days on the third day, Sunday evening, he would stand in the midst of his disciples and say, just as he stands in our midst 
regularly and says, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. He would breathe on them and say, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Obviously, this man is far more than a man. And so Thomas will confess, after doubting, my Lord and my God. He is so much more than a man. And so we too have learned to say, this is my Lord who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature. He is more than a man to the saints and angels in heaven who call him King of kings and Lord of lords. Don't forget who this man is and remember your responsibility to him. It's easy for us to say that Peter never should have gone into that courtyard that night where he got himself into so much trouble. But it wasn't just curiosity that brought him there. It was love. It was regret. It was this hope that somehow, just maybe, he could do something to help. But if Peter felt that he must go there, he shouldn't go there depending on his own wits to keep him faithful and his own strength to keep him from falling into sin against his Lord. He must not forget the warning that Jesus gave him. Our Lord has given us warnings too. He's told us, do not be yoked unequally together with unbelievers. The Lord has also warned, bad company corrupts good character. It's been said it is best to spend time in this life with those you wish and expect to spend eternity with. But if by necessity or by choice or out of love for the Savior, we are drawn into close company with scoffers and blasphemers, then we must go there with a sense of responsibility and with a sense of caution, recalling the Lord's warning to Peter. At the very least, we want to be ready to answer the question of loyalty. You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? At the very least, we want to be able to answer the question loyally, whether before governors or kings or serving girls. The sad story is told of a young man who went off to the university knowing that he would encounter many non-Christians and even outspoken scoffers amongst his peers and his professors. And his parents had surely warned him, as had his pastor. When he returned home at Christmas time, his parents asked him how it had gone. Had he been mocked a great deal? Had he been attacked for being a Christian and proud of his success the young man said no not at all nobody knows that I'm a Christian yet silence is also an expression of denial you are not one of this man's disciples too are you Peter denied with an oath his cursing and swearing evidence that he had really cut himself off from his Savior. But silence is disloyalty also and denial. How will we answer this question of loyalty? Let our answer be obvious. We want to say yes but we want to answer in his strength because our own will never suffice. 
they said to Peter, surely you are one of them, for your accent gives you away. Your accent gives you away. The way you talk tells whether or not you are one of this man's disciples. Can people tell that we are, or do they suspect that we are not, followers of Jesus by the way we talk? Remember, even unbelievers expect, sometimes even insist on, pure and clean speech and conduct from those that they know belong to Christ. But more than simply keeping it clean, let our whole vocabulary be expressive of the love and confidence and conviction that we have in Jesus. This man. Let the accents of our speech indicate that we are in fellowship with God through Christ, that we are members of God's family. You are not one of this man's disciples too, are you? A disciple is a learner, a follower, a person under Discipline, that's where the word comes from. May God fill us with his spirit so that it may be obvious that the Lord is in charge of our lives, that we follow Jesus, that the Holy Ghost is instructing us with his word. May God fill us with his spirit so that we can stand with men like John of Saxony, one of the electors of the Holy Roman Empire. At Augsburg, he had to decide whether or not he was going to tempt the Pope and the Emperor. He could have simply let the theologians deliver the Augsburg Confession and stayed silent. But no, he insisted, I too want to confess my Christ. And so, as a layman, he signed the Augsburg Confession, putting his own career at risk. There is the answer to the question of loyalty. Have you he heard ever of Baron Jasper von Erzen? I don't know anything about him either, except one thing. He had them inscribe on his tombstone, this man also was with Jesus of Nazareth. Surely we don't want to wait until we're dead and buried to be identified that way. Surely I am another of this man's disciples. Keep up the good confession, now and always. Amen.